Welcome back. In 1969, it was an enormous source of pride for the United States that the first person to set foot on the moon was an American. But was that mission worth more than bragging rights? And are we racing to Mars more for pride than for science? So let's discuss all this. Adam Frank is professor of astrophysics at the University of Rochester. He's author of the upcoming book, The Little Book of Aliens. And Jana Maleko-Smith, senior associate with the Aerospace Security Project and Strategic Technologies Program with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So let's start with that first basic question here. Professor Frank, let me start with you. Uh, getting to Mars, is it simply for bragging rights or is there, is, is, is there a for all mankind type of mission here? Yeah, I think we want to step back a little bit and, and ask ourselves, you know, put this into history. 200 years ago, right, no human being had traveled faster than, uh, you know, 40 miles an hour on a horse unless they were falling to their death from a cliff, mm -hmm. right? And now there's a million people at any moment in, on airplanes, right, going 500 miles an hour. The a profound transformation in human culture that happened because of the technology, starting with the rail, um, is an analogy to 200 years from now, no matter who gets there, the transformation of becoming really a solar system-wide uh, species. You know, it's within 200 years, it's easy to imagine millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people living um, in space. And so really, when they look back, they'll look back on this moment, the way we look back on the first railroad lines being, yeah. being put down. So this is really, this is the direction humanity will take if we get past climate change and all the other crises. And John, look, uh, it does feel as if the real imperative to do this now is worth thinking in terms of national security as much as bragging rights, correct? There is certainly a geopolitical competition aspect to this thread in that the United States is leading the, the frontier at the cutting edge in developing technology to help support exploration of Mars and also be demonstrating what does it mean to be a good steward of space. This is an opportunity to work with allies and partners to promote responsible norms in outer space, addressing other tangential issues such as orbital debris, simply known as space junk. Mm -hmm. So that is one component, but the other aspect of that is also the scientific exploration here to help unlock some of the mysteries of the origin and evolution of life and also Mars potentially being a future planet that could help be the key to survival of humanity. Let me uh, ask this, why, why the focus on Mars, Jana, when we haven't, you know, you hear this actually, sometimes we've, we've explored more of space than we have our own oceans, but let's stick with the moon versus Mars. We've barely explored the moon, and it feels like we ought to spend the rest of this century doing that, no? That's a fair point. I would walk us back to looking at some of the history around the policy of this particular issue, specifically Space Policy Directive 1, issued by former President Trump, that directed NASA to develop a innovative and sustainable program for lunar exploration and also Mars and other deep space exploration efforts. So the language of that Space Policy Directive also helped inform NASA's National Space Exploration Campaign, and the report that was published in 2018 has five pillars. The fifth pillar of that expressly references the need to promote exploration for Mars. The fourth pillar of that mm -hmm. talks about lunar exploration. Uh, the third as well, yeah. the, the, uh, speaking to robotic missions, and then the second about space operations beyond cis -lunar Lunar space and the first component of that uh, five pillar strategy yeah. is looking at the transition of human space exploration, how to work with commercial partners in right. this area to help promote uh, NASA's exploration because the International Space Station, it's aging. And the right. Biden administration has pledged to extend the technical lifespan of the ISS through the end of 2030, and that leaves a void. And it's important that we're strategic in thinking how we sure. fill that void now in partnering with the private sector. Look, I, I get on that front, Adam, to, to get to the moon, but we're spending an awful lot of money to try to figure out how to get humans to Mars. When as Neil Tyson sort of made the point, you know, we're probably better off, it'd be cheaper to get more robots there, cheaper to do sort of that kind of exploration, while we wait for the technology to catch up so that it does become safer to get humans to Mars. It, that, that seems more logical, but it's not as sexy. 
Um, well, I also think there's another reason to Mars that we haven't talked about. There's no life on the moon, right? There's no question of astrobiology on the moon. The moon's a right. dead world. Mars was a blue world four billion years ago. Talk about climate change, right? Mm -hmm. This was a world that had an atmosphere um, for, for you know, at least probably half a billion years. So I, I, I don't think robots can do what human astronauts okay. can do when it comes to asking like what may be the most profound question ever. Are we the only time that life has happened? So right. Mars is the place, the best place in the solar system to look for the possibility of life. And that part of scientific exploration. So that you feel like has to be human. It has to be human. I think that robots can do a lot, yeah. but probably unless we get really lucky, you know, that the robot is able to hit the right place, right. Um, you know, you're really going to need boots on the ground to sort of make these sort of decisions on the fly and do things, you know, uh, ad hoc. Uh, not guessing here, but what do you think is something that you know Mars is going to teach us? Um, well, on, on a couple different levels, I think actually Mars is going to teach us about living in space. As I've said, you know, the, 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 the long-term future for humanity is trying to build biospheres, right? Mm -hmm. Our artificial biospheres. Um, and Mars is going to be the place. Uh, asteroids are another. I think we haven't really talked about the possibility of building space. My, we just published a paper on this, that you can turn asteroids into space cities. But Mars will be the first place we really learn how to um, use a planet that has the right amount of gravity that mm -hmm. you know, will actually be comfortable for humans to build artificial ecosystems that we can live in with you know, maybe you know, thousands of people. And this is the near term. Is there anything else in our solar system besides what you just said there, which is the idea of where we might have floating cities? On, on is it on comets or not on comets on, uh, on, on asteroids. asteroids that, yeah. that um, not, I don't want to get into that, but it sounds like if what, if they don't have a gravitational pull, how do you how do you not just float away? Well, what we showed was is that you yeah. can take an asteroid, hollow it out, and then spin it up, mm. and then you live on the inside on the spinning inside. And there's thousands of asteroids, mm -hmm. and each asteroid you could have Manhattan basically the same size of population that Manhattan has. So there's a lot of real estate potential out there. All right, Jana, there's another part of this whole uh, space race that it does seem like. Look, I understand from a geopolitical sense why we're competing with each other, but it does seem like a waste of resources that the private sector, NASA, uh, and China are essentially competing against each other. I do think Elon Musk and, and NASA are, are probably as much cooperative as they are competitive, but are we holding ourselves back by competing? I. I don't see it that way in that this being a novel form of competition and I'll explain what I mean by that that since the the early 1960s there's been a a competition to pursue space exploration and I'm thinking uh, specifically of Mars with the United States uh, Mariner 4 spacecraft which was the first to take photographs of Mars and uh, in 1965 and shortly thereafter uh, the Soviet Union being the first t uh, nation to do a soft landing of their spacecraft um, uh, uh, Mars 3 mm -hmm. on the surface of Mars losing uh, transmission shortly thereafter but if we look history is a very helpful guidebook here to look at the the, the space race competition that we're seeing play out playing out now and how other how that has been that's been present at the very beginning uh, but there's two ways that we can look at it that we can either bemoan the competition aspect of it mm -hmm. or also see areas of potential uh, collaboration here. To use a, a popular adage by Abraham Lincoln, we can either rejoice that thorns have flowers yeah. or lament that flowers have thorns. So I see that here and how the, um, the, the United States is working with allies and partners to help build relationships to pursue deep space exploration. NASA's Artemis program, the Global Space Initiative, is a huge component yeah. of that. Adam, I want to close with this, which is, are we, um, should we have already been where we are right now? Meaning, you know, we, we went through this dead period of the space program, at least publicly. I think the Challenger accident's the obvious inflection point that happened uh, in, in 86, and it seems as if everything, it didn't technically grind to a halt, but it felt like it did. You think we lost two decades, three decades um, of, of, you know, where should we, which, should we have been landing a rover 20 years ago? Uh, you know, that's a really interesting question because there's two answers to it. One is absolutely, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 50 years, right. what were we thinking? People dreamed of going to the moon since the Greeks, and then we got there and we're like, yeah, we don't and need to We're done. Anymore. Yeah, like, what right, the heck? Right, yeah. But on the other hand, you know, the, outlet mall? the technology, yeah. in some sense, by waiting this long, we allowed computer technology, we allowed um, uh, um, uh, 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 
un understanding of materials mm -hmm. to get to the point where we could do things that we couldn't do back then. Right. So, right, we could bemoan it, but I also see that um, the private sector, yeah. which we really need to talk about, the commercial uh, exploitation, so to speak, presence in space, is yeah. really what's going to drive a lot of the of long future. And that probably required waiting a bit and getting these new technologies. Well, as Jana just pointed out, you're f so what if your flower has a few thorns? <laughs> That's right. uh, and Jana and do what Adam, you, do. <laughs> you two were terrific. That Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.